question. Um, all things happening, very curious, everybody's being very cautious, watching things. We're, we're moving um, in this particular society into a new phase of mind control and so socialization brought about by the religious confrontation known as the attack on the Twin Towers on September 11th. And when you look in the Bible, the book of Ecclesiastes says that things that happen already have happened. And there is nothing new under the sun. Everything is repeated in one form or another. There was an attack against Jews um, in York, England at Clifford's Tower in 1190, an anti-Jewish tower attack in 1190. And then, of course, we lived through an anti-Jewish towers attack on 9-11. And so, you know, when you look at those things, you say, gee, you know, there is nothing new under the sun, but it gives you pause because then you say, well, gee, you know, is this all planned to be this way? How could that be? You know, coincidence? Eh. But I mean, if you have the words that say all of these things happened before, and then you actually see things that are so coincidental that you, you begin to say, are these things laid out like a play, a drama? And everybody takes part in the drama in a different way. I mean, you know, we used to kill people with swords. Now we use missiles so we can kill a lot more. So we've evolved. And instead of using the evolution as to how we can better feed and clothe and house people, we use the evolution into how we can better kill people. So when we think about what happened before is happening again, then we move into a strange world of what we have generally referred to as spirit. The strange world of the invisible that programs existence. Think of that. An invisible force that programs resistance. And as a, and as a result, life forms play themselves out utilizing the same script. You know, we're, we're all reading the same script over and over but in different degrees of evolution. We have different things to use. We have different life forms, but it's the same basic script that we're reading. Uh, even Shakespeare said all life is, is a play, is a stage, and all the people are players. And, and it seems that if what we are seeing in the York Tower, 1190, anti-Jewish, the Twin Towers, 9-11, anti is, you know, is this really the same script and are we, we, we going through the same drama in a different way? It could be. But there is a, a caution then to me that would say if that's true, then there is some kind of plan, some kind of Maybe a divine, I hate to use that word, <coughs> but you know what I'm talking about. Some kind of a plan that is devised by an invisible power somewhere. Could that be? There is no new thing under the sun. Now let's look at that because it's very important. It, it not only speaks of occurrences, it speaks of people, including you. Let's look at overhead 153. The thing that has been is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. Oh my goodness. And there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything where it might be said, look, this is new? No. It's been already of old time, which was before. There is nothing new. Now, when I was thinking of that, I was thinking, consider when you look at an old person dying in a hospital. And then you turn and you look at a new baby being born, maybe two floors down in the same hospital. The thing that has been lying in the bed dying is that which shall be. The little baby, two floors down. People will say, I don't believe in reincarnation, but yet they'll say they believe in the Word of God, and the Word of God says, there is no new thing. 
That little baby, look, a brand new baby. No, it's not. Because it's of old. That which is, is already been. And that's what the book is saying. There's a time that's going to come when the line applies to you. That which has been. Oh, I remember Joe. He was a great guy. Too bad he passed on. Is that which is. <laughs> Here's Joe. You know. Here's uh, Josephine. I mean, who knows? <laughs> and that which is done is that which shall be done. Things that happen are recycled. They occur in various forms. And all of existence experiences them in one way or another. And there is no new thing under the sun because everything is recycled. I mean, you know, it, it, it bo I, I, that expression I don't like boggles my mind either, but it, it really does because I get religious and Christian people that say the Bible is the unerring word of God. When you talk about this, say, well, this proves reincarnation. I'll say, I don't believe in reincarnation. Well, then don't then rip the page out. Is there anything new? Look what it says there. Is there anything, say, new? That somebody could say, see this now? Look, it's new. Look at a newborn baby in a mother's arms. It's already been. See, just think of it. Here is a newborn baby in its mother's arms, and it's a beautiful sight. And so now the Bible says about that newborn baby, is there anything new where it might be say, see, this is new? <laughs> it has already been of old time. That little baby has been around and around and around and around over and over and over again. And the Bible says it. But you see, people read these things and never apply them to anything. You go to church, you've read this a million times, nobody's ever applied it to anything. Just read it. I mean, just read it. I'll read the Word of God. I won't let it get into my head because then I'll start thinking things that the pastor wouldn't agree with. So you see, an anti-Jewish attack on a tower in York, England in 1190, and then you see the anti-Jewish attack on the Twin Towers in New York on 9-11, and it fits perfectly into the Bible's definition or description of the repetitive nature of things. There is no new thing under the sun. Moses. Remember Moses? He was leading the people out of the wilderness. And he was taken to the mountaintop by God in this myth. And he was allowed to see the promised land, but God says, you're not going to be allowed to go into it. And the next day, according to the Bible, he died. Martin Luther King, at the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, came out, stood behind the pulpit, said, I've been to the mountaintop, I've seen the promised land, I won't be going in with you. The very next day, he died. You know, it's the same drama. Even, even, if, even if the Moses part was mythology. It's a script. It's written. It could have been written by uh, you know, the guy that wrote uh, Phantom of the Opera. Who wrote that? Who was... Andrew Lloyd Webber or something like that. I mean, it's a script, it's a drama. And Shakespeare is right. It's a play, and all the people are players in the drama. Did you ever see the situation with uh, Kennedy and Lincoln? I know you've seen it many times, but let's take a look at it. Overhead 503, just for, just for curious. Abraham Lincoln's successor was Andrew Johnson, born in 1808. John Kennedy's successor was Lyndon Johnson, born in 1908. Lincoln's assassination, John Wilkes Booth, was born in 1839. Kennedy's assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald, was born in 1939. Booth shot Lincoln in a theater and fled to a warehouse. Oswald shot Kennedy in a warehouse and fled to a theater. Lincoln had a secretary named Kennedy who told him not to go to the theater. Kennedy had a secretary named Lincoln who told him not to go to Dallas. And both Kennedy and Lincoln were shot in the back of the head in the presence of their wives. And so what does the, the Ecclesiastes say? That which has been, has already been. See? But when you look at things like this, then it gives credibility to, to these scriptures. And it says there is no new thing under the sun. Amazingly, you could really, if, if you were of a mind to and f could figure out how to do this, Go back and look at things that have happened and get a pretty good idea as to what's going to happen. Because, as the scripture says, it's all acted out over and over again. 
And just as human life is actually not new, as things occur over and over and over, so does the evolution of various forms of governments and religions. It all happens over and over again. Unless you break that chain, which some people call karma, you break that chain and, 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 you, and you move from this direction and go off in another direction entirely, it's going to play itself out over and over again. The changes that you anticipate from Eta Carina, supernova, happened in a big way in the Soviet Union. <clears throat> Their whole lifestyle changed. <clears throat> they, they, they got rid of communism and then they embraced the mafia. You know, they're probably much worse off than they were before, but nonetheless, something happened. And now it's happening in a big way in this culture that is called the United States. It's, you, can, you can feel it, you can sense it. Something is changing. Tremendous change here. From, from, from the time of the election of the president uh, back in uh, January when he took office until now, the entire country has changed. In a big, 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 big way. Not, not necessarily blaming him, because obviously it would appear that these things are set in a play, and you go into Act 3 or Act 4 or whatever it is, and here we go. And, 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 and when these changes occur, they become irreversible. And while the most precious thing that these people have is taken away from them, they'll wave flags and they'll cheer and they'll sing God Bless America. Nobody knows what's going on. The people in Germany in the 1930s were good people, decent people. They were trying to get things straightened out and they got caught up in the emotions of it and they waved flags and they sang their songs and they lost everything. It wasn't taken away from them, they gave it away. A few months ago, you can take that down. In our culture, the most pressing problem was Monica Lewinsky and then Gary Condi. You don't even know who these people are. Now it's recession, high unemployment, war, national fuel, paranoia. I mean, you walk into a, I walked into a post office. There was a guy that had a mask and rubber gloves on, asking me how I am. What do you mean, how I am? How are you? What the heck are you doing? <laughs> What's this all about? You know, and then you find yourself out in the car, and you're opening the mail, and you're carrying your stuff out, and you're pouring alcohol on your hands. And... <laughs> but, but this is the worst. I don't know how many of you are aware of this. And, and probably not too many people are, because they're waving flags, and they're singing God Bless America. But a few months ago, very quietly, something called the Patriots Act was approved by this Congress to fight terrorism. It gives authorities the right to go into your house when you're not there, search every room, and then tell you after the fact. The next day they can call you and say, hey, we found some pretty trashy stuff under your bed there, uh, Renee." <laughs> you laugh, and I laugh too, but it's true. Nobody knows it. The president has the highest approval rating that you could possibly have. God Bless America is sung at every uh, inning of a baseball game, and the flags are waving, and yet somebody now can walk into your house legally and go through whatever they want to go through, and you can't say a word about it. The collapse of life as we know it in the land of the free is amazing and quite scary for those who depend on their elected leaders. Their elected leaders, you know. I, I, it, it, I'm amazed that there's so many questions about the attack. I mean, how could they possibly have done it? Who were these people? How did they get in the planes? I mean, how come nobody noticed that you know, they were flying off course? Nobody said anything. And all of these questions. I mean, Monica Lewinsky, there was, there was congressional lawyers from all over the world, the FBI, Ken Starr, everybody asking questions. Guys come in with gra gavels and, and banging the thing. Well, we'll have the next witness in this case, this kid, you know, she's having sex with this guy. And, uh, uh, well, what the heck's going on? Here you have what this monstrous thing occurred. Nobody dares ask a question. Nobody investigates anything. Nobody knows anything. Nobody even knows, you know, you bomb in Afghanistan into a sand pit. Nobody even knows if they had anything to do with it. Nobody really knows. Oh, we have evidence. Some people, who's giving you the evidence, you know? It's very cool. Crazy stuff. But if the movement 
that is occurring now continues, then the elected leaders that you've elected will be as powerless against the military as the rest of us are. Your economy collapses into a recession. Your unemployment skyrockets. You have war. You have fear. You have biological attacks in the mail. You have the elimination of freedoms and the right given to police to go into your house at will. And people wave flags. And the government has a high approval rate. Same thing happened in the 1930s. And I'm not, don't let me say, I'm not saying that the government is Nazis or George Bush is Nazis. And I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying the way things evolve. Remember what I said? There is no new thing under the sun that happened before. People don't have their freedoms taken away from them. They give them away. When you think about that, it sounds like uh, the warlords or war of the worlds of George Orwell who wrote that book. Hello, Mr. Citizen. Do you have your ID as you're walking down Route 9? Here is a freedom that protected you against the government that has gone away while we're singing and waving flags. I mean, you know, I understand that we're going to win the conflict in Afghanistan. I have no question about that. But you know what's the amazing thing? When the Russians went in there and were fighting these same people, we supplied the people that we're now trying to kill so that they could beat the Russians. If we had helped the Russians at that time, those Twin Towers would probably still be standing. But we didn't. We get strange bedfellows depending on what's, what the dollar says. Now, here, here's another thing that just happened. If you were accused of a crime and speak on the phone with your attorney, the government now has the right to wiretap that conversation while you're talking to your lawyer. They have the right to listen in on anything you say and use what you say in confidence to your lawyer against you. Let me show you something. Overhead 504, and there's, I think, four parts of it. This is from the Associated Press. What in the world is that? I don't know. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> they <stuck together. laughs> okay. Good job here. The Associated Press. Sidestepping the principle of lawyer-client privacy, the Justice Department is letting investigators monitor phone calls and mail between some terrorist suspects and their defense lawyer. The move stunned many. Now, you say, well, you know, you've got to do it against them. But see, once they put it in place against them, then it applies to you, too. The move stunned many in the legal profession which cherish the absolute secrecy of conversation with clients. This proposal is a terrifying nightmare for innocent people who are under suspicion by the Attorney General, said the Civil Liberties Union. That's right. How do you know? I mean, you know, whatever you say in secret now can be used, even if you're talking to your lawyer. A rule published October 31st says the monitoring can take place when the Attorney General, now this guy, be careful with this character here, because he is also the same one who last week said that the people who voted for physician-assisted suicide in Oregon couldn't do it, and he was trying to slam that down. So he's breaking in on what the states can do. So there is a reasonable suspicion. If he has a reasonable suspicion, you know, he can listen. The rule be, which took effect the day before it became public is one of a series of steps by the uh, Bush administration designed to make it easier to capture and prosecute terrorist substance. And everybody wants that. But that's always the way. I'm looking at Ecclesiastes. It's always the way you get absolute control over everything. Now anti-terrorism give police sweeping new powers to secretly search people's homes and business records and to eavesdrop on telephone and computer conversations. The Social Security investigator also is pressing for the right to disclose personal tax records, Social Security numbers, and other data. This comes from the Associated Press. This isn't from some right-wing or left-wing thing. Many lawyers regard the department's move of monitoring inmate attorney communicate as a step too far. Former federal prosecutor, white-collar defense attorney Walsh said the chain chips away at the protected attorney-client privilege, which should give everyone pause. There is a very definite camel with his nose under the temp concern. Prisoners see many of their rights curtailed and incarcerated, but generally not the guarantee of private communication with their lawyers. Would you put the next one on? Just bear with me for a second, because it's, it's just something people should, you know, be aware of. This seems at first glance like a very troubling approach. Gary Goldstein, associate criminal defense lawyer, said it will inhibit criminal defendants from making plea agreements. with. Pro what do you think monitoring does in terms of a client being honest and communicating in good faith with his lawyer? 
when they know the government is listening, why should they ever talk about pleading guilty? New York University law professor believes the rule raises constitutional and civil liberties concerns. The rule requires that any disclosures, except for those necessary to thwart an imminent act of violence, must be approved by a federal judge. Rule also requires attorney and his client be given notice of the government's listening activity. That's right. Don't even bother with the next one. I don't, well, I don't know if there's any. Government said it was necessary to put the rule in effect without public comment. This is the, this is the interesting here. The rule in effect without public comment to allow the Justice Department to... Re but once that rule is in effect, it's in effect. Okay. So that's where you're going. You know, you're waving the flags and you're singing God Bless America and at the same time you're handing over the freedoms that people died and fought for for many, many years. There is a, you know, a, a very, very scary thing about government when it becomes that powerful. So, for years in here I have asked you to find a way into yourself so as to separate yourself from the groups of the world and of this nation, including the government. Separate from religious groups, separate from government groups, and move yourself close to the great light that we call God. As you can see, only by flowing in an inner harmony can you be truly free. We have met the enemy, and the enemy is us. Otherwise, you're going to be continued to be dragged with them into this abyss that is forming in which their insane religious beliefs bring them into various kinds of violent confrontations with all sides proclaiming God is on our side. Total insanity built upon religious beliefs is what we're in the middle of. It is absolute insanity. The inmates are running the prison. You have now beliefs that do not come from God, but come from people who claim they are God's messengers. People who claim that they are doing the will of God. And once you begin to believe these people, you're cooked. You're done. And, and you can see it. You know, they, they go in, they give their money, they come out, and whatever they say, they don't question. Nobody, they don't question because you're not allowed to question. Your entire mind now functions not in a belief of God, but in a belief of an interpretation of God giving, given by this particular cult. And, and believe me, Christianity is a cult. Anytime you have everybody thinking the same way and getting up and getting down and believing the same thing and not allowed to question any of the truths, it's a cult. And it's, it's a horror. It's a nightmare. The most important thing for your safety and for your children and for your family and for the sanity of your family is to abandon all belief. Have no beliefs. Because you can't have belief without having doubt. Somebody believes in God. Somebody believes there is no God. But they're both believers. Bhagwan Rajneesh, one of my favorite mentors, made this statement, which I think is reasonable. Once you start seeing things as they are, without any barrier of doubt and belief, without any thinking, then you have come home. Then you can have a communion with reality, and you can call that reality God, enlightenment, truth. Those are just names. Any name will do, because reality has no name of its own. It is nameless. It is a nameless experience. We fall in line behind the finger of fear, We're scared to death. People are frightened. They're, you know, afraid of each other. They're afraid of the government. They're afraid of the, for, afraid. They're, they're scared, scared of religion. They're scared of. In fact, religion survives by making people frightened. Scare the hell out of them, or scare the hell into them, and then they really get frightened. So now we're afraid of terrorists. And we don't even, we're not even allowed to know that they're not terrorists, they're religious fundamentalists. You never heard anybody say that. That's what they were, that's what they are. And so we don't even know when our elected officials draw up laws that take our freedoms away, and they do it without even allowing you to comment on it. 
We don't even know they're doing it. We wave our flag, we sing, God bless, and then behind the scenes they're doing all this stuff. Nobody knows. You're out at a ball game and singing God bless America and waving the flag and the cops are in your house. We follow religion blindly because we're told if we don't, we're going to go to hell. And so our belief is in all kinds of strange things that are totally out of character with God, who created a very scientifically based universe. There's no hocus pocus about the earth. There's no hocus pocus about the universe. It's very scientific, very reasonable, once you understand how it operates. But we place our entire basis of reason upon symbols and myths as being literal. And then anyone questions is called antichrist or anti-religion or coming against my religion or coming against God. <laughs> yeah, I wish everybody would. No one is allowed to use common sense and logic. It doesn't fit with religion. And so between beliefs forced on us by religion and beliefs forced on us by the government, we're left waving our hands with our flags and praising some God that we've invented. We've invented this God that we're praying this God. Who made this God up? The ones that made this God up were the people that were putting women in the cesspool of, of existence. The ones that made this God up are people that wouldn't allow anybody to question or say anything at the thought of getting their throat cut. These are the people that made this God up at a time when, when the world as we know it was called the Dark Ages. That's where your religion came from, the Dark Ages. Stupidity and insanity, and we still have it. And so we sing and we wave flags and we praise a government no matter how intrusive against us and no matter how violent against others. It doesn't make any difference. We can get up there and we can scream and raise hell about our uh, Omasama and the bin, whatever they are, Taliban or whatever, the, how miserable and how hateful they are, but we never even suggest that we did one thing wrong when we napalmed Vietnam, burned everybody to death and destroyed the country. Oh, that was okay. I mean, you know, we were just trying to... Come on. I mean, I can stand up here on television and say, I believe that people in politics and people in religion are bull shooters. And I do. They shoot the bull. That's okay. No problem. But if I turn that O's in bull shooter to an I, then people will be storming the TV station to take it off. You can't say that. That's disgusting. Well, all I did was turn an O into an I. What's evil about I? Or is it okay with an O? How come O is not evil? Well, it's not that it's evil, Mr. Ron. Here, the point is, if one is combined with an S, H, and a T, it becomes evil. Why? <laughs> if, I can, if, I, if I combine O with an S, H, and a T, it's okay. It says shot. But if I contain I with an S, H, and a T, it's not okay because it says, and I can't even say it. Because the I is evil. So if somebody said that when the I gets in there, you can't say it. I can say you're a bullshooter, but I can't put an I in there because people get very so messed up by people that have decided what is good and what is evil and what is right and what is wrong. We can't even read the Bible in peace. How are you going to read the Bible now? Because it's evil if you take an eye and put it where an O should be. Let me show you something. Overhead 157. Would somebody like to stand up and read this scripture? And they shall make an ark. Oh my God, look at the word. <laughs> I can't be there. It's got to be S-H-O because putting an eye in there is evil. You know what I'm saying here? I get all upset. It has to be shooting wood. And yet that's the word of God. And what is it, folks? Let's hear you. <laughs> See, they said it. You can't blame me. I get all upset. And when I want to have a Bible study with the kids, who's going to come up and read this scripture from God's holy word? We'll all turn your Bibles. Would you take that off, please? Would you all turn your Bibles, please? You have your Bibles? Okay. Would you all turn to Isaiah 36, 12? 
Thank you very much. The Word of God, the uncompromising Word of God, we all read it together. But Rabbi Shah said, Hath my master sent me to thy master, and to thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men that sit upon the wall, that they may... <laughs> this is the word of God. Come on, Pastor. <laughs> Read it! Now, oh, I find all this stuff. <laughs> Just zoom in on that one, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> it's on TV. Can't say there's anything wrong with it, because it's not got an I with a T, but it's got uh, <laughs> And say pee, pee in there, does it? If it said pee, pee probably wouldn't be so bad. <laughs> Who's ever stood up in the church and read that scripture to the congregation? Who's ever got up in the church and questioned that that scripture was in the Bible? Well, who will get up and question the Patriots' law that allows police to evade your home? No one. This is okay. Perfectly okay. If you, if you caught your kid reading this out of a book somewhere, you'd take the book away and slap him. Don't you ever let me catch you reading stuff like that. Oh my, it's the word of God. <laughs> I think you can take it down. We've enjoyed that. Huh? But that's in the Bible. There's a lot of stuff in there. You see, here's the problem. If you have to fight back as we are, then you, you, you dwell on national security, which we're doing. You're fighting to retain your freedom in the process. And you're not going to let anyone take your freedom away from you. That's what the president says, and that's what the generals say, and that's what the Senate says. We're not going to, they're against our freedoms, and we're not going to let anybody take our freedom away from us. We're not. We gave it away. You give it away because it's part of national security. It's always been that way. It was that way in Germany. And that's what the Bible means. The things that are are the things that have been. You better be careful. And basically, probably, there's nothing you can do other than scream and yell. Now, instead of fighting against these people, let's change it. Instead of fighting, we did the absolutely unpardonable and unthinkable thing. We met with them in some clandestine place, sat down and talked with them. The absolutely unthinkable thing. We didn't send missiles. We sent people in a dark place in a room somewhere, and we sat and we talked. And somehow, someway, we reach some kind of a accord, and your national security is no longer threatened, and you have not given your freedom away. Because that, what you saw today, about the police going into your homes and the police wiretapping conversations with your attorney, is a hundred times more threatening than even what happened in New York. But the die has already been cast. We've chosen to fight, and we are fighting. And we have chosen through our elected representatives to let them take our freedoms away. And so now the police are in charge of you. And as I said before, the entire justice, the Congress got up and carried out all kinds of investigations about Monica Lewinsky. They impeached, they indicted, they had Ken Starr, they had the entire FBI looking into Monica Lewinsky. This was a big deal. Now, where is the Congress and where is Ken Starr to investigate the facts about this attack on the World Trade Center? I've heard strange things, and I don't know if they're true or not, because on the internet you get a lot of credit, but I mean, I've never heard anybody question some of the strange things. How could this have happened in a couple hours? Nobody dares say anything. What's going on? Who is truly at the bottom of all this mayhem and murder? Nobody dares question anything. And, and, you know, they're totally leveling this country over there, and they're going to, you know, destroy it and kill Ben. They even know if they did it. Really don't. Well, I've said what I've said. And now I take you on the true course that flows to the place of light, across the cosmic seas to the great light. We meet here on Sundays because the center point of our attention is not government, although it has been over the past few weeks. Not religions, not wars or threats. Our center point is God. I had a guy write me an email and he said, you know, 
all this crap that they're putting out. There's only one thing that counts. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And I wrote him back, I said, you're wrong. Not one tongue will be able to confess that Jesus is Lord unless they're doing what he said. And that means practicing the single eye, watching, entering within yourself and finding the kingdom of God, separating from the thoughts of the mind. And I said, you, my friend, are also one who will not be able to call him Lord because he would have to ask you the same thing that he asked everyone else in the Bible. Why do you call me Lord and not do the things I tell you to do? But I preside in the little room where everybody that wanders in can walk out saying, indeed, Jesus is Lord because we've carried out everything that he's asked us to do. The invisible power of the entire universe that has created and operates the energies available to each one of us in our going and our coming from life to life is what we are here to discuss. And the question that raises itself over and over again is what is God? Let me ask you a question. I'm going to write it out. Maybe you can dwell on it as we talk for a minute. Does God answer prayer? Ask your religious friend. Ask someone from Christian or ask somebody from a Jewish or ask somebody from a Muslim. Ask them, does God answer prayer? Do you think that God answers prayer? Is there a God that answers prayer? Of course God answers prayer. What's the use of praying if God doesn't answer prayer? God bless America is a prayer, isn't it? Then consider this because we have placed before our eyes prayer in its deepest and most profound sort and God suddenly coming out from behind the shadows, in plain view of everyone, in plain view of all of us out of the invisible universe, to act, to answer a prayer in front of all of us, and it happened. Prayer. Does God answer prayer? Here you have a situation that we've just lived through that played itself out in the most graphic way. A plane is hijacked. The hijackers are religious fundamentalists. They are in deep prayer. Let us look at the letter of instructions from Muhammad Atta, and we will, we will just focus on references to prayer. Okay? This letter was given by the ringleader of this attack, Muhammad Atta, the first guy to steer one of those planes into the World Trade Center. All right? These were his instructions to the other people. Look, overhead 477, and we'll look at paragraph 8, 11, 14, and 15. Paragraph 8, pray during the night and be persistent in asking God to give you victory. Okay? Paragraph 11, okay? Ask God for his mercy and be optimistic. Paragraph 14, remind yourselves of the supplications, the morning and evening supplications, the supplications of entering a town. All supplications are all prayer. And 15, bless your body with some verses of the Koran. Prayer, prayer. These are instructions to the hijackers, okay? Look at overhead. 478, and we'll do paragraph 3 and paragraph 5. Pray in the morning prayer in a group and ponder the great rewards of that prayer. Okay? 5, when you have reached the airport, that is, and left the tacky, say a supplication. Oh, Lord, I ask you for the best of this place. Oh, Lord, I ask you to protect me from its evils. And everywhere you go, say that prayer and smile and be calm, okay? And say, oh, Lord, protect me from them. And say, oh, Lord, take your anger out on them, the enemy, you. And ask you, protect us from their evils. And oh, Lord, block their vision from in front of them so they may not see. And say, God is all we need. He is the best to rely on. Pray, 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 pray. This is from the hijackers. 
Huh? What I there was another one. Yeah, paragraph 12 here, down here to paragraph 12. You must remember your brothers. No one should notice. There is no God but God because if you say it a thousand times, you know, nobody will be able to tell what you're doing and so forth and so on. Pray, pray, pray. Okay. What was that? That was 100, that was 470. Look at 479. 3, 4, and 5. 3. You must remember to make supplications wherever you go and anytime you do anything and God is with his people and protect you. Okay? 4. When you ride uh, the airplane, before your footsteps in the plane, before you enter it, make a prayer and supplications. Okay? When you step inside and sit in your seat, that's in the airplane, begin with the known supplications. Be busy with the constant remember of God. Oh, ye faithful, and so forth. And then number five, this is the movement when the plane takes off. Remember God, as he said, and blah, 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 and his prophet said, give us the victory, make the ground shake under their feet, pray for yourselves, and all, I want you to concentrate on this one. Concentrate on this one. Pray, let me find that, pray for yourself and all of your brothers that they may be victorious and hit their targets and ask God to grant you martyrdom. Pray, 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 okay? Now, so there are the instructions. Now oh, wait, there's one other, isn't there? 480, 480, paragraph two and three. Don't forget. Ba, 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 uh, wholeheartedly welcome death for the sake of God. Always remember God. Either end your life while praying seconds before the target, or make your last words. There is no God but God, and Muhammad is His messenger. And four, uh, we'll meet in the highest heaven. Uh, is that what I want to? Yeah, that's these, these share one. Pray at the second that you hit the target, you are to pray, make your last words, there is no God. But God. Remember that God gave victory. Yeah, but, yeah, right, okay, right. Remember God gave victory to his faithful, sorry. So there is no doubt that the hijackers were praying to God to be successful in their attack. They were praying for God to protect them is there any doubt that these were religious fundamentalists? And, and see, this is what drives me nuts. You can't get the government to even take, to tell people what these people were doing. For some reason, our government avoids referring to them in this way. And you know why? Because you've got a religious fundamentalist government in the now, and they can't connect themselves to these people. But they are. It's the same stuff. This guy is Jerry Falwell with a turban. <laughs> For some reason, our government refers to them as terrorists and not as religious fundamentals, yet it is absolutely clear that God is the entire reason for the mission and prayer was the basis of this plan. There's no doubt about it. Every bit of the activity, as I've shown you, was based on prayer. So now the question is, and here's what I'm going to throw at you, did God hear their prayers and did God listen to them? They prayed that their mission would be a success, they would hit their target, and that the eyes of the enemy, meaning our side, would be blinded. Did God hear their prayers? And did God say yes? You remember? Here, here, here you got four guys... Or, uh, all these people walking in to major airports in Washington, in, in Newark, or Boston, all over the place, taking big planes, and nobody knew. And then flying them off course. And the President of the United States didn't even know it happened until the first one hit the, the guy. T the guy was supposed to be going from Boston to California, he made a left turn, headed down to New York. The President of the United States didn't know it until the plane hit the World Trade Center. Nobody knew. Nobody saw anything. Let me look at that prayer. It's an important prayer. See? I'm going to see if a prayer was answered. Are you with me here? You get, you get these people taking over these planes. Nobody knew anything was happening. They, they take them and they do all of this stuff and nobody knew and they fly all over the place and nobody knows. Let me show you something. Go back to overhead 478 and look at paragraph 5 again for just a minute. And remember this. Remember this prayer. Oh, Lord block their vision from in front of them so that they may not see. And they didn't see. God answered that prayer. And if God answered all these prayers and made their attack against the World Trade Center successful, this is the guy you're asking to bless you. God bless him. What are you going to get from this guy? 
They hijacked four planes from four large international airports. They took over each of the planes, flew them off course from one state to another. Either no one saw or was able to bring themselves to do anything until after the planes had crashed into the World Trade Center. And that's exactly what they asked in their prayer. Thus did God answer their prayers and were our eyes blinded. And so there is no doubt. You can take that. There is no doubt that the hijackers were praying for the success of their mission. Now I ask you, that's the prayer of the hijackers. And it sure seems like it was answered, didn't it? Who else was praying on those planes? You don't think they were praying? You don't think they were praying, oh God, do something, save my life, save me out of this? God, don't let this happen. God, protect me. God, do something. Intervene. Don't you think God, don't you think people were praying on these planes knowing what was going on, that God would protect their lives and save them? Well, the hijackers were successful. They brought down the World Trade Center in an hour. That's the question. Did God answer their prayer? It seems so. And the passengers who prayed all died. They were not saved. Their lives are not protected. Did God answer their prayers? Obviously not. What are we going to do with that? So at first glance, it would appear that God answered the prayers of the hijackers and was with them in this mission. And if this is the God we're asking to bless us as we sing God Bless America, you would have to think twice. Are you sure you want the blessings from this guy? like he blessed the passengers on those planes? But if you really look at this, you'll see that God wasn't involved in any way whatsoever. He didn't bless the hijackers. He didn't bless the passengers. God didn't answer anybody's prayer. One very important prayer made by the hijackers went unanswered. As such, one can confidently conclude that God was not involved. And one would have to also conclude that God does not answer prayer, at least as we've traditionally said. One of the instructions contained in the hijacker's letter is very revealing about the part that God played in this. And we'll look at it in overhead 479, and we'll go to paragraph 5. This is the moment that both, so remember God, pour your patience upon us in his word. Oh Lord, you gave us the victory over them. Give us the victory. Now here's the, here's, here's, here's the one. Pray for yourself and all of your brothers that they may be victorious and hit their targets. One plane didn't. It crashed into Pennsylvania in the ground and that to me proves that God did not answer their prayer. God didn't answer their prayers. God didn't answer their prayers. The two planes that hit the World Trade Center were victorious, and the plane that hit the Pentagon was victorious, but the fourth plane encountered a problem when the passengers revolted and it crashed, and therefore, praying for their brothers that they may be victorious was not answered. What does it mean? God does not answer prayer in the form and the way that we have been taught and that we believe. It doesn't happen. If you are in a plane and it's going down from 30,000 feet, you are going to die. There is no God anywhere in the universe that can or will do anything about that. If you are confronted by someone with a gun and they fire a bullet into you, you are going to be hurt or you're going to die. It depends not on God, it depends on where the bullet hits you. When the World Trade Center collapsed, those who were able to get out lived. Those who did not died. It did not depend on God, it depended on the ability to leave, it depended on what floor you were on. Those on the first floor had a chance, those on the top floors had no chance. God had nothing to do with it. If we could only get to the point of understanding and coming to grips with reality and confessing that this is truth and stop the bull shooting, 
then we could get to the point of coming face to face and reach out into the arms of God. Because... Two prayers not answered. Excuse me? There may be two prayers not answered. The second the plane to hit the Pentagon, I'm not sure it wasn't heading for the White House. Well, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, all I can do, John, is show what I'm sure of. I don't, I don't know. You may be right. John was saying there may be two prayers not answered. That other plane was supposed, maybe was going to the White House and hit the Pentagon. I don't, I don't really know. But I do know that one hit the ground, and that's not where it wanted to go. Al Bianchi had a stroke. Al's not here today. No, 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 not no, not, not, no, he didn't have a stroke today. I mean, no, no. He's, he, he's on vacation in the, um... Hey, every, where the heck is he? The Catskills already. He's up at the Catskills at the Pincus and the Pines or wherever he goes. He's having a great time. What I mean, a long time ago, he had a stroke. Please. But here's the point. Al, Al Bianchi had a stroke many years ago. His right side is paralyzed. He is a very vibrant, exciting, go get him guy. But no prayer that exists will ever restore anyone who had a stroke. Doctors may someday. <laughs> but we delude ourselves that by asking for something, it will happen. If you believe, you will receive. I went through all that stuff. And so people have prayed and claimed that they have received an answer. But in reality, they never received any answer. Does that mean there's no God? No. Does that mean that God does not have a plan? No, it means that life plays itself out. If we follow God's instructions, good things happen. If we make up our own rules, bad things happen. We've constructed a picture of God as a man, a man who is concerned with all matter of stuff that we're concerned with, our physical health, our wealth. Oh, God, help me choose whether I should get the Pontiac or I should get the Chevrolet and all this stuff. Oh, God, I want the DVD, but please make my husband not play it so loud. Oh, God, you know, all this crap. We, we break it down to include our job, our schoolwork, you know, oh God. I, 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 I tell you, I'm many times, you know, when I was a kid, I used to pray that the Brooklyn Dodgers would win ball games. <laughs> and I'd just let Duke Snyder hit a home run, and I wouldn't ask for anything. I was a little kid, you know, I was really into this stuff. We pray our love life, our ability to play sports. We've determined that God is a father image who worries when we come home late. He's upset if we smoke a cigarette. God will get so picked if we read Playboy magazine. We're nuts because of all these crazy people that get up and teach us this stuff and say, this is what God wants. We've constructed all kinds of different rules, like you can't put I between S and H, but you can put O's. It's okay. We have women wear head coverings. There they have a woman, covers, they cover everything, we cover their heads. It all depends on how far the particular culture is. We make up a social order and then we declare it's God's will. It's all a creation of our own imagination. And how we interpret stories written thousands of years ago. How long have I been going here? Um, 50 minutes. 50? Mm -hmm. Could you give me five more? Because I, I can't go 10 more because it, that, that only goes an hour to pay. <laughs> Incidentally, as a new, I might have paused to make a new announcement. Um, the tapes will be lowered in price because I can no longer, we're now copying in digital. And digital does not allow me to put two hours on these things, only one. So you only get one message per tape, but we are reducing the price. So we don't have five minutes left anymore now. <laughs> <laughs> but let, 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 me, let, me, let, me, let me just tell you something. I wanted to get into this. We make a social order, but what is the truth? How can we ever find the truth? We use Bibles and Korans and Vedas and Sutras, but in the final sense, this is the thing that religion doesn't allow. You've got to use common sense. And isn't that funny? Whenever you use common sense, you're considered the Antichrist, or you're against religion. What does common sense say? The, ready, I want you to be common sense with me. You ready? We go common, this is, we're going to do this, and that's the end of it. The Greeks wrote mythology. Everybody understand that? The Greeks wrote mythology. Mythology is a symbolic statement of scientific applications 
related to astronomy and anatomy. That's what mythology is. Okay? Now, the Greeks. The Bible. The Old Testament became a Greek document in 300 BC. The New Testament is entirely a Greek document. A Greek document filled with symbolic writings. Common sense. The Bible is Greek mythology. The name of the Jewish Messiah, Jesus, is a Greek name. Thus evidence that this indeed is Greek mythology. Because if it wasn't Greek mythology, the guy would have a Jewish name. He doesn't. He has a Greek name. It doesn't have any connection to anything Jewish. It's Greek. People say, it's Yahshua. No, it isn't. It's Esaias. It's Greek. The second coming is preceded by a white horse in the sky. The white horse in the sky is Pegasus of Greek mythology. Thus common sense is beginning to provide us with a logical basis upon which we can read the ancient texts. They are mythological symbols representing anatomy and astronomy. And they come from that Greek culture. Now who objects to that? The ones who object to that who refuse to apply common sense to the subject of God. Those who insist on taking symbols literal. So is this God a father? Is this God concerned with the things that human beings are concerned with in some cases? But in most cases, no. Why? Why is it? Because what is the nature of this entity called God? Why would this entity called God be concerned in ways that are different than we are concerned? Why would God allow the World Trade Center to be destroyed and all these people killed? If God was a man, chances are God would intervene and stop it. A big hand would come down and grab that plane. But God is not a man. And that's where we have to use common sense to attempt an understanding of what we call the divine. Let's look at this, and then this is the last thing we look at, B42. We're out of here. Here's the simplistic answer. Numbers 23:19 of the Bible, God God is not a man. 1 John 1, 5, God is light. And no one has ever for a moment tried to attempt reasoning with light. No one has ever attempted to communicate with light. There is a way, there is a position, there is a, a, a reasonable approach to communicating with God. And I will show you what Jesus Christ himself explains, that the only possible way to get through to God is to understand God is light. Because Jesus, as he says in the scripture, only in spirit can anyone approach him. Not with words. Whether you're in an airplane or whether you're in here, not with words. Yeah, you're grinning and you're staring. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Thank you.